session uh, is just a very, very emotive topic and it has been in the headlines for quite some time, yeah? And uh, in today's session, what we're trying to do is to unpack, yeah? Provide those insights um, <clears throat> and, and, and understand the importance of why the government in 2022 tried to revoke the ban and what are the implications on the trade, uh, production, and also the regulations um, uh, and the food security and nutrition. So um, I'm very honored today to, to really moderate this uh, session. And um, I'd like to call upon my guests. Uh, I'll start with Anne Muya. Um, Anne Muya, she's the senior biosafety officer National Biosafety Authority. Kindly come to the stage. And then we have, uh, before even Prof, to, uh, Prof sits, I would like to invite her. It's a great honor to have her here today, Professor Ruth K. Onyango, who is a professor and former parliamentarian in Kenya, uh, editor and founder of AGF Fund, uh, chair of board and Sasakawa Africa Association. Professor, please. Okay, I'll start by them introducing themselves, who they are, um, and then from there we can take it from, I'll, 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 we'll go to the next step. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, delegates, uh, guests, sponsors, and everyone else, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here uh, uh, this day. My name, as you've heard, is Anne Moya, a senior biosafety officer with the National Biosafety Authority. National Biosafety Authority is uh, the state agency that is mandated to oversee uh, biotechnology in Kenya uh, from research all the way to commercialization and even 20 years after commercialization. So our mandate, our mission is to ensure and assure safety to human health, to animal health, and to the environment uh, in handling genetic modification and uh, biotechnologies, uh, the old genetic modification as well as the emerging technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor. Good introduce. morning. Um, I'm Ruth Onyango. I'm Kenyan. I'm retired, but you don't retire from food issues, so that's why I'm here. I like the issue of food safety, what goes into my stomach, and uh, um, but I've known of this uh, conference for a long time, <laughs> so I came from my retirement to come and talk and uh, to also see what is exhibited. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. So you can give them a round of applause, please. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah, uh, kindly allow me to pass uh, Dr. Mugira's apologies. He really wanted to be here, but uh, him being the CEO of the organization, he has many responsibilities. And today there was one that he could not get away from. So he sent me to represent him. Uh, so kindly accept his apologies. You've heard of the GMO policy uh, taking effect in Kenya. And um, in your view, how is it promoting or hindering the technology, innovation and investment in Kenya? And um, what, how does it now affect our overall competitiveness in the agriculture uh, sector? Okay. Um. This is on, yeah? <laughs> Good morning again. Um, I, I didn't know you were just going to focus on GMO today. I, I, I've been trying to avoid this, uh, getting involved in this discussion, because I've been there from the beginning, when GMO first came, when people would virtually walk out of the room if you mentioned B GMO, when they would even attack whoever is presenting when they mentioned GMO. And I was inclined to be amongst those until a time came and I told myself that I was a scientist. 
I was a scientist. I have to go with the evidence. I have to question. And I have to know more. And that's when I was invited to join the, uh, the Monsanto uh, Biotechnology Advisory Council to learn. And so I visited St. Louis, Missouri, where Monsanto was. I went through their labs. I listened to the scientists. And I said, this is what Africa needs, this kind of setup for science and research. And so we were just saying no to things without understanding what they were. I also realized that increasingly consumers don't believe science anymore. They don't trust science. So if you bring here bread, we shall eat bread, right? When, bread first, when I first ate bread, I never asked what was in it. It was something new to us. And for those kinds of food products, we, we trusted. Whoever is preparing them is doing the right thing. Government is, has supported it. We're doing the right thing. So as time has gone on, there's just too much democracy. I mean, see what America is going through. Too much democracy. Everybody has an idea, everybody has a stand, and everybody can take you to court. So you can go ahead and do the right thing, pass it, but a consumer will go to court and hold it all back. You see? So we don't trust science, and we don't trust government. In fact, you say, oh, government supports that, then it's no good. If scientists are supporting that, that's no good. And so how many of us here, by the way, are anti-GMO? Can I see hands up? How many here? Or we are just, you know, speaking to the converted. <laughs> how many? Let's see his hands up. Who is anti-GMO? Okay, who is for GMO? Who is not sure? You see, we normally just talk to ourselves. And you can define GMO. Yeah? Uh, Dr. Owen there said, we just shortened the process. <laughs> you know? we've, we've been having genetic mod modification, genetic progress all through. It's just that the system, the progress is much shorter. It's like having a human being becoming six feet when they are three years old, maybe, something like that. The other thing consumers are not very sure of is where we are taking that gene from. So you say, okay, you took a gene from a monkey and you put it in maize, you know. You, know, you just play around. And that's why we say scientists must be ethical. We have to trust them that they are doing something good for humanity, not like creating an atom bomb which then goes and kills hundreds and th of thousands of people. The other thing is facing us right now, artificial intelligence. Do you know what artificial intelligence is, what they are saying right now? That even human beings we may seize to be relevant. And when we cease to be relevant, we shall cease to exist. So that's the technology, yeah? That's the technologies we are talking about. Innovation and every stage, you know, has its challenges. So GMO, I went to the Monsanto place, I talked about it, and actually now the I was part, I was on that board when they were developing the water efficient maize. So in two or three when I was in the Kenyan parliament, that's when that issue came up of GMO. Yeah? I remember coming back from, from a meeting in Tanzania to Kenya to the parliament because a colleague who is a scientist, a colleague then had oranges, mangoes, tomatoes, there, I just entered when he was now speaking, 
telling parliamentarians, do you know these fruits, they have come from South Africa? They are all GMO. They are going to sterilize your women. They are going to cause obesity. He was there talking, actually saying those things. And I said, my friend, because the idea, the motion was we have to ban GMO for Kenya. My point at that time was not that I believe in GMO. It was that we are going to stifle science. We are going to stifle innovation. This same methodology you are rejecting may be the one that may save mankind. And Kenya is going to become a laughing stock because we have said no to GMO. Let's allow the science. I think it's from there on that we had the NBA get into place that if we don't have an authority to help us check whether something is GMO or not, how will you know? Every so often we are told, oh, maize was turned back at the port of Mombasa coming from South Africa because it's GMO. But if you ask a Kenyan, they'll tell you we don't even believe it. I'm sure it's here already. So as a Kenyan, I can tell you this. I think we have just been eating GMO all along. Because we are food deficient. Things come in. You don't know where they have come from. We don't trace, right? We have a robust system of regulation, of inspection. But if you go to the supermarket right now, we live even be able to tell what is GMO. So then recently I saw a newspaper when that GMO came and the, our president, the current government said, we are now removing the ban, a 10 year ban, right? People called me, I saw people on newspaper headline, you know, they want to kill themselves, they want to demonstrate. But you know what was happening at that time? Kenyans were dying of hunger. Kenyans were dying. I didn't hear anybody say they want to kill themselves because Kenyans are dying of hunger. But because of GMO, and many of them could not even pronounce that name, they did not even know what it meant, and they don't even know what the science is be behind it. So it then becomes political. It's been politicized. Okay. Okay? So personally, I'll tell you this. Because I've been traveling a lot, you know, if I eat food on the plane, I don't ask whether it is GMO. Chances are it is, right? Mm. If you get anything that has soya bean in it, it is GMO. Are you able to tell? So my support of it is mostly for the science, to progress science. We must do so. Secondly, there is a lot of bad food we eat, which is not GMO. Food safety is so key for Africa. And foodborne diseases, waterborne diseases, kill so many of us every single day. I'd rather eat GMO anytime because there has been so much scrutiny on it. And then lastly, really, GMO is not going to save the world. It's not. Are you telling me that when we have GMO approved, we won't have hunger in Kenya? No. It's just one off. One off. The strategy is to ensure we can grow foods where it could not be grown. We could have more nutrition where it could not be found. But at the end of the day, people need to have choice. But they can only have choice if they have a strong consumer movement. Because a lot of the people are not scientists and they don't understand. So we need to be sure that the regulation is very important, that you are really above the board, mm -hmm. you can be believed, and that we are lucky as developing countries because we are coming following countries which have already gone through this these okay. issues. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, to, to Anne, so what are the potential uh, economic impact of this policy to the agricultural sector? 
and trade. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Just uh, before I answer the question, eh, I would like to clarify that uh, the policy that we have in Kenya actually is a biotechnology policy. Uh, and that is uh, what I highlighted a little bit. The other thing which is where we fall under is the biosafety regulatory framework. So we don't have a, a GMO policy per se. We have a biotechnology policy and we have uh, the uh, biosafety regulatory framework. Now, uh, in terms, if we talk about trade implications, as, as I noted earlier, our regulations are very much aligned to international standards. Uh, GMOs have been traded for over two, two decades now. So Kenya is not the first country to grow and maybe to trade in, in GMOs. They have been there for, uh, for a long time. The U.S. has been uh, trading, uh, using, cultivating, using, and trading with GMOs. Uh, 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 many other countries in South America, Brazil, Argentina, they have been doing that. They have been growing GMOs. They have been exporting them to all over the world, to Europe, to China, and to many other places. So in terms of trade implications, uh, I don't believe that we can say there will be much of trend implications because of uh, the framework, because of the biosafety regulatory framework. Uh, if anything, uh, we are likely to have, because what the technology seeks to do is to increase crop yield, to reduce losses. Uh, there's, a lo there's a lot of uh, crop that is lost to pests and uh, other opportunistic infections that come uh, after the pests uh, investation. So if this is reduced, then we are likely to have maybe more agricultural produce. And then perhaps we'll be able to feed ourselves and perhaps even have surplus to export to our neighbors, maybe. Because so far I can say we have been, uh, and I think we all know that we have been importing so much of the food that we eat. So if we could become self-sufficient, I believe that is good. If we could have some surplus to export, I believe that would be good. Uh, I don't think a, a country, any country that trades with Kenya could have a problem uh, continuing trading with Kenya. As long as uh, there is that robust, robust regulatory framework, they are assured that whatever is coming out of Kenya, whether GMO or otherwise, is, is safe. It has, uh, there are good regulations. There are uh, regulators that are up to the task that ensure that the food uh, produced in Kenya is safe. OK. Yeah. So briefly, Prof. Um, so you've been an MP. You've, um, I think, at a certain point, worked in the government. Um, what's your view and um, what are the potential strategy or policy recommendations you can give to maximize the benefits of GM uh, foods in Kenya uh, while addressing concerns related to food security, trade, and uh, nutrition? And how can um, the stakeholders collaborate to achieve this balanced approach? Yeah, just briefly. <laughs> well, brief, yeah. You, you, you know, you, you've made this become GMO. She talked about biotechnology generally. Biotechnology is wide, it's not just GMO. And that's what happens when you bring GMO into the discussion. That's what people focus on. You know, it's like abortion. Do you support it or don't you? Without understanding why you don't or you do support it. So I, I'm not sure about the, the downside of Kenya allowing GMO yet. I think the jury is still out. Because we, the, the most traded product in the region is food. What policies do these other countries we trade with have? It just so happens that Uganda, Tanzania gives us rice, Uganda gives us maize, Ethiopia gives us maize. I don't know whether they want maize from Kenya. I think the jury is still out. We need research on that. Just because of allowing GMO. We are sitting quietly 
and uh, 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 you know, believing things will be different. But we are the importers, not the exporters of what will be the GMO crop. So I, I, I would like us to somebody to do that research actually, to find out. But when you just think of biotechnology, Kenya is supposed to be up there, next to South Africa, for example. People look up to us, and I agree with what she said, that anything that comes from Mars should be good, but there's no guarantee. And the problem with any technology, other technologies, BT cotton, is okay. It does not go into our mouth, right? We are talking of foods which we put in our mouths. And they start telling you, oh, look at America. They have accepted GMO, you know, they have obesity, they have all these issues, and so on and so on. That's what we talk of democracy. So we need to really have a robust regulatory system, which we do. But more than regulation, we need inspection by people who know what they are inspecting. I'm, I'm patron of our, our food science group in, 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 in Kenya, and the president is here, <laughs> uh, Jojo Oko. And they are doing a lot of work on food safety. And I don't know whether you are working with this organization, George, Biosafety Authority, and addressing, putting GMO in the broader concept of food, food safety. But you have to bring yourselves to a level where you can be believed, where you can be understood, and where the messaging is very clear. I think the problem with GMO is that it, the messaging was never clear by scientists. And so we are always coming back trying to explain. We should be able to explain in a way that does not have the scientific jargon. You know, get PR, you know, journalists to explain, to understand, to explain to the consumers. Because at the end of the day, it should be an option. It should be an option. And so the regulatory aspect is very important. And then you bring in the corruption bit, right? The corruption bit. Uh, imagine yesterday I was watching a clip, a documentary on Harvey Wiley of the USA. Wiley, that name is so common. Without him, they will not be having the Food and Drug Administration in the US. These issues we are talking of, corruption, you know, uh, uh, corrupted businesses, corrupting members of parliament and government. America has gone through all that. We don't have to go through all that. We can actually message much better. We shall trade better, but most importantly, we should be able to actually feed ourselves. We are policies already. I've been part of many of these policies. But you know, a drought comes, a major drought comes, and that's when we discover, oh, do we have policies? Do we have policies? Something not right, you know, in terms of progression and continuity. Okay. So in the interest of time, um, I'll open it up to the plenary to ask a question. I'll give around three uh, individuals to be able to ask questions to the able uh, panel. So do we have any questions from the plenary? You can raise your hand and then uh, the microphone will reach you. OK, uh, thank you very much. I'm Clive Fayuko. I happen to be a freelance journalist. And my question is to Professor. Is there actually consensus within the scientific community whether GMO is safe or is it not safe? Because even from where I sit, from the interviews I conduct, you talk to a specialist and then, like, if you can answer, if you can ask a question, is, is GMO safe? And the answer you'll get is, is yes and no. So is there a consensus? Because it's actually even confusing for us. Thank you. What did you say your name was? I'm Clive. Clive, 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 what, what is consensus? You know, we are in this, I, I, I don't know why I find myself in this era, you know. I don't know what is consensus. You can even have a board of 12 people 
And you need only one to say no. And the whole thing. You see, you need one person to go to court, right? Yeah? Like Okio Mutata goes to court. Everybody else may be saying yes, but one person goes to court and it stops and it delays. That's where we are. I don't know what consensus is. We could be here having consensus and you just step out to people outside here <laughs> and they run away from something called GMO. So it's a tough time right now. We need to figure out a way of restoring trust in science and trust in the government. Because for a long time, we just went by what government said was okay, because they have checked. You know, it's like uh, the head of household who say, you eat this, it's okay for you, and you go ahead and eat it. We need to trust our scientists. Do we trust them? But our own scientists also are not sure, like you have said. They say yes or no. What is yes or no? And as I said, the problem is that that product is going into my body. By the time I found out that it is no good, it has harmed me already. That is the fear. So I can't talk of consensus, really. Any question? I believe this should be the second last question. Hi, my name is Regina. I work for Exotic EPZ. We do export of macadamia nuts. And my question would be, you find in the export market, they're asking you for organic products. But you're now talking about introducing GMO. Are we not going to be in a point of a crisis? Because the US is asking us to export to them organic products, but you're talking about GMOs. And? <laughs> Thank you for that uh, question, Regina. I think that uh, goes back to the issue of uh, consumer choice. There is uh, just the same thing. There is someone here who prefers beef. There is another one who prefers chicken. Another one who prefers fish. Uh, I, if I post the question here, is coffee good for you? Some will lift up their hands. Others believe it's not good for you. So. At the end of the day, and I think that also reflects back to the consensus question, I think the regulators uh, as, uh, and the government, the du the, our duty is to ensure that it is safe. And then you can make a choice. Are you going to take it or not? But either way, whatever choice that you make is not based on safety. Because before it is released to the public, to the consumers, there is an assurance of safety. So the, the, the issue of uh, organic farm, farming, it is good. And it has been there for a long time. And I know there, is, uh, there has been a lot of uh, hype now on it because of the many lifestyle diseases and uh, the information that is flowing out there is what is causing these lifestyle diseases. Some of the information is correct. Some of the information is false. But either way, if someone feels that they believe what is being said, that uh, maybe if they want to believe that GMO is the cause of their obesity, which completely is not true, it is not founded in science at all, then they have the choice to pick organic farming. And when uh, we talk about GMOs being approved for use in Kenya, it's not that it's going to be forced on everyone. It's not going to be forced on all the farmers. Farmers, again, have a choice. If they want to grow, to do organic farming, they have a choice to do that. And the same way that organic farmers have a choice to do their organic farming, other farmers have also have uh, the same right. They should also be able to make a choice to grow GMOs if, if they so need. So one is not going to affect the other. Nobody is going to ban or prevent organic farming. Organic farming will continue. And I believe in many markets because organic farming uh, is, is a bit more, should I, should I say, more difficult to do in large scale. That is why sometimes uh, it, it, it fetches maybe a premium price because it's not very easy to do organic farming in large scale, to my understanding. So it will fetch a premium price, so you'll find there's a demand for it. So if you want to go down that route, that is wonderful. Uh, like uh, 
Prof said, GMO is not the, the, the only solution. Actually, we talk about it should be, you know, the, 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 the issue of food security and uh, Kenya feeding itself. It should be approached in an integrated kind of way. Uh, 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 GMOs will solve the problem of pests, for example. Then there is now the issue of soil fertility. What needs to be done? Crop rotation uh, and all those other uh, agro-farming uh, technologies that are out there. Uh, maybe agroforestry, you know. All that is welcome. It's not supposed to be a, a GM, uh, biotechnology and GMOs is not the only solution. It is one of the solutions among all those others. Yes, thank you. Maybe one last question before we wrap. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Osman Kumo. I'm the director of procurement Nigerian Council of Food Science and Technology. Um, I want to just uh, make some observations on your presentation. Uh, first of all, on the slide, um, there was a place you said after the application, um, there is an expert review. Expert review. Um, my assumption is that uh, the biosafety agency is the mess of experts itself. And then um, if you look at it procurement-wise, if you have to go to um, expert review after application, apart from in-house review of the agency, uh, it means it's going to cost you a lot. Or how, how do you engage such expert to review it? One. Secondly, um, um, before taking decision of the board, uh, don't you think that there is a need for a, a consumer opinion before the board finally take decision? Because, um, um, for example, um, there was a time in Nigeria um, there, is, there, was, there is a product called Ajinomoto. Some part of the country um, have that belief that it reduces fertility. So um, don't you think that after the application, after the expert review, after there is a need for it to be presented to consumers to get their opinion before the board finally um, take decision. And then finally, um, I assume you'll give us some um, case studies of some African countries, their biosafety laws, so that to see how efficacy, um, how it's effective, the one for, for Kenya biosafety agency. Meaning, uh, maybe you take like, like African biosafety laws um, on one other country, Tanzania, so that when we look at the, uh, the them, we'll be able to know um, whether your own uh, laws have some defects. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for, for those questions. Uh, on, on the expert reviewers, so what happens is that, yes, the staff of uh, NBA, the technical division of uh, the technical directorate of NBA, uh, they are experts on the all rights. We have biotechnologists, we have uh, environmental scientists, we have ecologists, we have biochemists. So there are experts there. Uh, However, as I mentioned, we also do know, and actually this is also a provision of the Cartagena Protocol, that they encourage uh, party members to even engage uh, expertise from outside to be able even to give more uh, professional views regarding the same. So what happens when you, an applicant, uh, they are submitting an application, there's usually an application fee. So basically, this is the application fee that is used to give, uh, not to pay, but just to give like an honor honorarium to the experts that are doing the review. Most of these experts are scientists, of course, because the process has to be science-based. And more than that, we usually require the experts because they, uh, they have more expertise in that particular area. For example, personally, I'm trained in biotechnology. So if maybe an application is uh, something to do with microbiology, I may, not, I may have some, some knowledge of it, but there's someone who, out there who has more knowledge. So why don't we... Uh, make use of that knowledge. And uh, our experts, I can say that they're usually 
ready actually to assist because these are scientists and they want to see science, science go forward. So, in fact, uh, they have been operating, been given very, very, very little as honorarium and they do uh, very good work. So, uh, the other thing is about con uh, consumer participation. When the experts are doing their work and the other regulatory agencies, actually it, the process goes uh, together. Uh, there is also the case of public participation. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, once an application for environmental release comes to NBA, an advert will be put on newspapers, on our website, on the Kenya Gazette, and uh, even on posters around word of mouth uh, uh, that there is this application, a summary of up the application is given, what it is all about, if it's for BT maize, that it is for BT maize that offers protection against Tembora, it contains this and this. And the public is given, and that includes anyone, consumers, farmers, anyone, they are given 30 days to actually send in their, their, their comments, to give their opinions. They can do it in written form, uh, emails, phone calls, whichever way. So these opinions are considered when we are making the final report that goes to the board that helps the board to make a decision. So we usually we have, a, I can say, a, a good public participation. Everyone is given an opportunity to give their opinion. And of course, when uh, that opportunity comes for you to give your opinion, try to be as clear as possible. Try to give uh, your reasons for and against because again if you say that uh, let's let me just pick an example that i don't want gmo it causes cancer research has been done and it has been shown that there is no association whatsoever so that is an opinion and we respect it but given that the process is supposed to be science-based, if we use this opinion to make a decision, how can we be, we be able to defend this decision? So the public opinion is very important. Socioeconomic considerations are very important uh, because I can tell you like uh, the one environmental release application that actually did not get approval, it was not a biosafety issue. It was uh, on economic considerations. So. These things are all taken into consideration before a decision is made. Now, regarding other African biosafety laws, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Uganda does not, has not yet, uh, the, the act, the law is not yet in place. I know there has been a bill, but I have no information that it has been passed. Last I know it has not yet been passed. Uh, Tanzania, uh, they also have their ways, but I cannot say that the framework is as robust as the Kenyan framework, but I stand to be corrected. Uh, uh, the laws that I'm uh, more familiar with, uh, and I know that they are very similar to Kenyan, we have the Nigerian biosafety framework. It's, uh, it's very similar to Kenyan framework. The same with the uh, Ghanaian. Uh, biosafety framework is also very similar. Ethiopian, they have also been doing a lot of review and it's actually taken shape to also be very similar to Kenyan. Um, South, Africa. South Africa, South Africa, of course, they are on a league of their own. They are very far ahead of the rest of Africa when it comes to adoption of biotechnology. They also have a robust framework. Yeah, I think those are the countries that I can comment for. Now, even uh, Zambia, Zambia, they also have a robust framework. Actually, they have been um, learning a lot from Kenya, benchmarking with Kenya and the other African countries that have the framework. The African Union have been uh, working to actually harmonize the uh, frameworks for Africa so that there are no major differences, just to ensure that uh, there are no trade uh, hindrances. Yeah. All right, yeah. so um, I think we have run over time, and uh, I would really like to thank my panel. And um, just to close, I would like um, for one minute give us a reflection each, yeah? Yeah. to give a reflection on today's discussion yeah. at your parting shot. Um, I think all countries should have a biosafety authority. Because that helps you to judge and to gauge 
what you want to do. Uh, secondly, we should not demonize uh, biotechnology, uh, a GMO. After all, many of the medicines we have, including insulin and diabetes also is on the increase, is actually from GMO uh, technology. So that's very important. And lastly, <laughs> at the end of the day, our own foods, they are not GMO, if you are worried about GMO. Because of Corona, we were able to go back to our own traditional foods, imagine. Because those foods, many of them, especially the vegetables, are medicine. And people kept wondering, how come Africans didn't drop like flies like we thought they would during Corona? You can go to the men of the countries I've been to, they have gone back to our traditional foods. Let's promote them as we attend to this science we are talking about yeah. But thank you. Uh, the discussion has to continue. Let's not just talk GMO every time something comes up. But it, for people, especially the media, they are the ones who should support the consumers and inform them with good messaging. They should come along with the science. We should always include them. And uh, one of the other problems we have, we don't have a strong consumer organization. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you, thank you. Now, uh, just to comment uh, on this uh, and to make it uh, clear, uh, just a I think this is a repetition. The National Biosafety Authority is a regulator. Our place is to ensure that uh, the biotechnology that is in use in Kenya does not pose any uh, adverse effects uh, to Kenya, whether the people, the animals, or even the environment. Uh, so if you see a product that has been approved in the, in the market, you can be sure it has gone through robust, thorough safety assessment before it is allowed to get there. The process, uh, maybe I did not mention, takes 90 to 150 days. Sometimes, uh, actually to the anger of the applicant, sometimes it even spills over to more than 150 days, which is not a nice thing. But uh, as much as we try to operate within the timelines, the most important thing is to ensure that safety is assured before it is allowed there. Uh, as for the ban, let me just comment on the ban. The ban was uh, put in place by the cabinet because I know there has been a lot of questions around that. The ban uh, was put in place through a uh, cabinet uh, directive, so to speak. And during that period, uh, uh, the NBA was working, uh, ensuring that no GMOs come through our borders into Kenya. So we have not been consuming GMOs in Kenya, at least within the Kenyan borders. Uh, once the ban was lifted last year, now the NBA gets into her mandate, not of keeping out GMOs, but ensuring that if GMOs are coming in, then they are safe uh, for our country and for the Kenyan people. So uh, just to make that clear, so once if, uh, the court cases, once they are done, then uh, the process continues. The biosafety framework has been in place even throughout that period of the ban. It is not just starting. I know we have had issues of uh, uh, maybe people wondering, uh, now the ban is lifted, what is going to happen? The framework has been in place. So it is just going to, the NBA will just continue on her mandate that uh, uh, was given to the NBA in 2010. And uh, finally, uh, the issue of food and food safety. Uh, it's, it's something that each one of us has a part to play. I believe in a multidisciplinary kind of uh, stakeholder engagements, coming together, sharing together, whether consumers, uh, civil society, scientists, farmers, regulators, each one has a part to play. The NBA has an open door policy. If you have something, information to share, you're, you're, you're free to do that. If you have questions, you're free to write to the NBA and ask those questions, and they'll be clarified. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause to 
very very engaging panel and also to you who really participated and uh, got to to follow the, this uh, technical uh, discussion though some I, I understand they are not uh, um, on the side of the technology so thank you very much uh, it's what a way to start uh, this summit uh, with a very emotive uh, 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 topic but uh, I think we have done justice to it thank you very much